In this video, I will explain some of the consequences of habitat fragmentation, which can be divided into good, bad outcomes, and then I will particularly insist on the consequences of anthropogenic or human-mediated habitat fragmentation. Instead of explaining what is habitat fragmentation and patchy landscapes, let me start with a question. Which of these habitats, according to you, are patchy or fragmented? Pause the video and think about it. If you answered any of these habitats, or even if you answered it depends, then you're correct. All of these habitats have some level of fragmentation at different scales. This fragmentation can be imposed by a simple road, as is the case with the prairies delimited with this third road that separates them into patches, or it can be the two mountain peaks that have specific high altitude habitats, which are separated by the valleys in between. Habitat patchiness can be present and can vary at different spatial and temporal scales. Some patchy habitats maintain their configuration for very long periods of time, such as serpentine soils and mountain tops. But the scale of spatial variation is obviously much smaller in serpentine patches compared to the mountain tops. In other habitats, patchiness varies over short time scales. Typical examples about this are the openings in forest following a forest fire or after a tree has fallen. The spatial scale of these variations is also small. Patching is created by anthropogenic actions, occurs at large spatial scales and over very short temporal spans. This video will talk about the consequences of habitat fragmentation. I will talk about the good and the bad of naturally occurring fragmentation, but bear in mind that these definitions are somewhat arbitrary and what might be perceived as a positive effect on a certain scale or for one species, it can have a negative effect on different scales for other species. And then for the last part, I will also talk about a more recent type of habitat fragmentation, which is due to human activities and how their consequences differ compared to the naturally fragmented habitats. Let's start with the good or the not so bad. Patchiness, first of all, protects vulnerable species that can seek shelter in highly specialized or unfrequently occurring patches. Two examples about this that are part of my research work is the adaptation of the Czech endemic species Minuartes meikari to survive in the highly toxic serpentine soils, or the highly ruderal species Lamium amplexicoli, which thrives in patches that have been recently disturbed, such as tilled fields and forests after they have experienced fire. Patchiness allows for resource complementation. Habitats that are more uniformly fragmented allow for better distribution of resources or habitats for certain species. For example, an animal that feeds in the green patches and seeks shelter in the yellow patches will be better off in a landscape that contains several well-distributed, homogeneously distributed patches of each habitat type, rather than a more homogeneous and less fragmented landscape which limits its access to the resources or to the shelter. Another important aspect of naturally patchy habitats is the edge effect. The habitat conditions are not the same in the center of the patch as they are at the edge of the patch. Most of the time, edges of naturally patchy habitats are not abrupt. If you have ever walked in a forest, you have noticed how the vegetation composition Temperature, light, and wind gradually change as you're going from the outskirts towards the center of the forest. This gradual change even further increases the diversity of landscape, and numerous species have specifically adapted to live on the habitat edge. So the more edge we have, 
the more suitable it will be for these species. Obviously, the benefit of the edge effect is cancelled out if it comes at the expense of other habitat types, which can happen if the patch size is too small. When you combine all these factors together, it turns out that patchy landscapes support generally higher biodiversity than homogeneous ones, and this has been empirically and theoretically observed. These images are simulations of the number of species that are maintained in landscapes with different levels of patchiness, from the least patchy one on the top left to the most patchy one on the bottom right. Although there is usually one dominant species in each landscape, in patchy landscapes you have more than one or two colors, presumably because having a more patchy landscape protects the smaller species from the negative effects of the dominant species. Let's now look at a few of the negative effects of naturally occurring habitat fragmentation. The most marked one might be that smaller patches bear lower biodiversity. There is an impressive amount of empirical studies showing that habitats with bigger areas have more species than smaller habitats. This relationship is called the species area curve and holds for different types of organisms across different types of habitats. These three plots show the positive relationship for amphibians, birds and mammals, and the colors of each line correspond the species area curve for different continents. There are multiple explanations about what causes this relationship. One very simple one is that when habitat size decreases, stochastic processes lead to the loss of some species and the selective pressure is too intense for other species to survive in a reduced area habitat. It should come as no surprise that smaller patches support populations of smaller size, mainly because they have fewer resources. Small populations are generally more sensitive to any changes in their demography or genetic structure, and are generally at higher risk of extinction. If by accident, without any selective pressure, a few individuals are eliminated from each of these two populations, the effect of this elimination will proportionally be larger in the population of reduced size, where it might even go unnoticed in the large population. More than simple loss of a few individuals, the genetic diversity in the small population was almost halved by the random elimination of these four individuals. This in turn can increase mating between related individuals and the inbred offspring is quite often less fit for survival than the outbred offspring, which makes the small population even more vulnerable. Altogether, these factors reduce the population size and adaptive potential, and if there is a sudden change in the environmental conditions and selective pressure of the patch, the population might not be able to adapt to it. The only way for this population to be maintained is by the migration of adapted individuals from a nearby population that is connected. This brings me to the next point, that isolated patches are at greater risk of definitive extinction. Patches that are not well connected, meaning that migration from one patch to the other is difficult, are much more difficult, if impossible, to be saved from extinction by migration or to be recolonized after extinction, because no new individuals can reach them. Bear in mind that isolation does not only mean physical distance between two patches, it can also be a separation imposed by some kind of geographical or human-made structure, and it can also happen because a species is not a very good migrating species. Lastly, the edge effect is not beneficial to all species, as previously mentioned. A species whose adaptive habitat is in the core of a large patch will have its available habitat largely reduced by fragmentation because the edge-to-core ratio decreases in a non-linear fashion. 
A typical example for this are large mammals that require big territories for, in search for resources or mating partners. There are plenty of other consequences of natural habitat fragmentation, but just based on these four, stop and think which of these statements about the consequences of habitat fragmentation are true. The positive effects are visible at the landscape and community level. The negative effects are visible at the population or individual patch level. The positive effects outnumber the negative effects or the negative effects are not always observed. If you selected the first two answers, then you are correct. When we look at the effects, the scale of the effects of the positive and negative consequences, we see that positive consequences are usually observable when we scale up to scales that englobe entire landscapes and entire communities with many populations and species. Whereas the negative effects are most often observed for individual populations that go extinct or have their adaptive potential reduced, or individual patches which can no longer support high levels of biodiversity or certain populations. Let's finish with the consequences of anthropogenic habitat fragmentation, which by some conservational biologists can be viewed as ugly. In the last 10,000 years, since the development of modern agriculture and human settlements, the landscape structure in some areas of the world is becoming patchier than ever, and the fragmentation process has exponentially accelerated in the past couple of centuries. On the map that you see here, the warm colors represent areas with the highest habitat fragmentation due to the construction of roads. And you can see that with exception of extreme northern altitudes and desert areas, most of human inhabited areas are highly fragmented by roads. And this is only one example of human mediated fragmentation caused by road construction. Now, based on what we have seen so far, you might think that a global level fragmentation as this one is not necessarily a bad thing. And yet, most biologists, myself included, often cite human-mediated habitat fragmentation among the top causes for loss of biodiversity. So what gives? Take a minute and pause this video to answer why does human-mediated habitat fragmentation have more negative consequences on ecosystems and communities than naturally occurring habitat fragmentation. If you selected the first four answers, you will be correct. Anthropogenic habitat fragmentation occurs too often, too quickly, at scales that are broader than what naturally occurs and the modification of the habitat matrix that surrounds the fragmented habitats is too intense and hostile. Let's review all of this in detail. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that the spatial and temporal extent of human-mediated fragmentation is unprecedented compared to what has naturally occurred so far. For an illustration, here is how the Madagascar forests have been affected by human activity since the 1950s. The affected habitat area is thousands of square kilometers, and it has drastically changed over the course of 60 years, which is quite short from evolutionary, but also from an ecological point of view. But even more than the fragmentation of the forest, you certainly notice that the total forest area has been drastically reduced, to be more precise, by more than 40% in the course of only 60 years. This reduction is probably even higher but we do not dispose of data before 1950. The reduction of the available habitat size are such that they largely cancel out the potential positive outcomes of environmental patchiness created by human activities. The modification of the area surrounding the habitat fragments, called matrix, is also extreme when habitat fragmentation is caused by human activities. On the right, you have a rural matrix separating patches of forest. 
This matrix does not favor the spread of some species, for instance arable weeds, but others, such as insects, birds and some mammals, might not be able to cross it, but also to partially adapt to surviving on it. The urban matrix on the left, however, consisting of tall concrete buildings densely colonized by humans, is a very extreme and hostile matrix, and most species trying to cross from one green patch to the other would probably not be able to do so. Finally, human tampering with ecological processes is such that they are delayed or modified to extreme levels. For instance, the mixture of intensive forest management, invasive and highly flammable shrubs, and global rise of the temperatures likely led to the catastrophic Australian fires in early 2020. Fires in Australia are not uncommon, but the scale and intensity of those that occurred in 2020 goes beyond what naturally happens, and the disturbed communities will need much more time to recover, if this is possible at all, from fires with such spread and intensity. Although the consequences of human-mediated habitat fragmentation are very alarming, there are some positive aspects as well. It looks like the negative aspects of anthropogenic fragmentation are mostly due to the destruction and isolation of patches and suitable habitats, rather than the fragmentation per se. As a matter of fact, a recent review showed that if it is possible to separate the effects of fragmentation from those of habitat destruction, which usually occurs simultaneously in anthropogenic habitat fragmentation, more often than not, fragmentation on its own has positive effects, even when it is caused by humans. This obviously does not mean that anthropogenic habitat modification can continue as we have been doing it so far, but it does provide some interesting guidelines for preservation of the habitats and biodiversity. If you would like to learn more about this, I invite you to read the review on the topic. Before I end the video, here is a challenge. In this presentation, there are at least three illustrations that have been generated by AI. If you can manage to find at least one of these illustrations and send me a screenshot of it, you're in for a small surprise. 